Hi everyone, um, this is a very special edition of Sashay Away with Barry because I am looking glamorous. I'm in a gown. Um, I just came from a work event. We had our center dinner tonight um, and had some amazing, amazing people there. Um, I met Nico Tortorello, ooh, and he is hot. Um, Ricky Martin was honored. His dame, Anna Wintour, was honored. And the amazing Emma Gonzalez from the park. I was going to say Park Slope, but that's in Brooklyn. The Parkland uh, shootings in Florida um, was honored as well, and she was fantastic. Um, so I have a bunch of videos to share with you from that. I'm hiding out in my bathroom because my boyfriend is asleep. It is, you know, past his bedtime is 10 p.m. Um, I haven't watched Drag yet, Race yet, but I'm about to once I get out of this outfit. Um, but I wanted to share those little videos with you, so enjoy! I'm sad you can't see the rest of my outfit. Maybe I'll do a pan down because the shoes are everything. Yes! And I have a giant slit as well to give my Angelina Jolie a leg. I don't know if you could see any of that because I couldn't see the camera, but there it is. Um, so I'm signing off and watch these wonderful videos. You get to hear some great speeches um, and see some fantastic people. Bye! Be here tonight among such beautiful people who are actively fighting for beautiful changes. I'm so grateful to you all and to the center for having me. I also want to thank Greg Belanti for being an invaluable pioneer in Hollywood and for creating safe spaces for artists like me to live out our dreams authentically. You will forever be a superhero in my heart, Greg, and I'm sure countless others. Okay, so I kept thinking like it's probably a little early in my career to, for me to receive an award like this because I just didn't feel like I had done enough in the community to deserve it. All I've really been doing is be myself. And then it clicked. That's the whole point. It's what we're so desperately working for to just be ourselves in this life. We all hear that piece of advice over and over again, be yourself. But what does it even mean? LGBTQ or not, truly being you seems to be the hardest thing for each of us to figure out. And I think it's because, as humans, we don't know exactly what we are. And I think I finally understand it now. We are love. <laughs> Moving, breathing, highly emotional, and infinitely unique expressions of love. That's it. So now when I hear the words, be yourself, what I really hear is, be love. It's strong, but vulnerable. Stunning, but shy. Caring, but also very afraid. When progress is made in the LGBTQ movement, progress is made in the movement of all mankind. It's important that we not only guide our youth to accept themselves, but that we inspire them to fall in love with themselves, because that's when we as humans truly blossom and are unlocked. That's how we become what I like to call wielders of the rainbow magic. Once we and the rest of the world truly realize just how beautiful and cool and magical it is to be LGBTQ, then we can all finally carry on doing the only job the universe requires of us, to simply be ourselves, which inevitably seems to bring joy, love, freedom, creativity, and a lot of rainbows to the whole entire world. That's the future we can create. That's the present we can all receive. I love you. Thank you so much. She literally sees more theater than I do, and it's my job. Anna sees our world, not just as it is, but as it could be. Anna sees our best creativity, our best equality, our best humanity. And that is vision. It is my great honor to present the Center's Visionary Award to Dame Anna Wintour. Great, great pleasure to be here and a thrill to accept this award. 
in front of so many creative, forward-thinking, politically-minded, civically-engaged, and most importantly, wonderfully-dressed people. <laughs> this is a time of upheaval in America and the world. But it's a moment of opportunity as well, especially for those with vision and courage to stand for what they believe in. My wonderful friend Jordan brings both of those qualities to everything he does. His very first Broadway production nearly 20 years ago was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. An homage to the many possibilities of human identity, if ever there was one. Today, he has brought back Angels in America, an American classic that through Jordan's brilliance has become new. These are not the most popular shows Jordan has produced, and I don't imagine that they are the most profitable. But he revised them because their message is important and they expand our vision in a critical way. So, what about the world of fashion? Today there are questions about one's role. Should we be activist? Should an industry so profitable dare to take a bold stance? And my answer is an unequivocal yes. <laughs> After all, what's more important to fashion than expressing your complete, true, and interesting self? The LGBTQ community has known this for a long time and has led the charge for open-mindedness and acceptance for decades. For years, I have been learning from all of you. When I was growing up in England, sexual identity was scarcely talked about. The world at large was presumed to be heterosexual and white, and anything more interesting than that was swept quietly under the carpet. Direct talk has never been a strength of the British. And when, and when it comes to sex, well, we'd rather talk about cricket. <laughs> I think back to that repressed time and I marvel at what incredible change there has been. I got to see firsthand the length and the difficulty of that road. I had only recently arrived in New York in the 80s when AIDS began to really take a toll. The darkness of that time was not only in watching so many extraordinary members of my community disappear, it was in how quiet those losses were, how much shame and stigma were attached to those bright lives. And yet the community rallied. I was so proud to be a part of Seventh on Sale, which raised money for AIDS charities, and we hope, helped bring the idea of support into the mainstream. And I have learned so much since then from those who have spoken out, whatever the cost. I think of Alessandra McKaylee, Mark Jacobs, and Tom Ford, who have used their brilliance in fashion to champion and to demonstrate the dignity of LGBTQ life. I think of theatrical leaders like Tony Kushner and Moises Kaufman, or Justin Vivian Bond, and of course, Jordan who opened our eyes to new narratives. I think of icons like Laverne Cox and Lady Gaga with her little monsters, and Ryan Murphy, whose forthcoming drama Pose about the New York voguing community in the 80s includes more openly trans people in front of and behind the camera than any other TV show in history. as Tammy Baldwin, the first openly gay U.S. Senator. And Danica Rome, the first transgender member of Virginia's House of Delegates. They aren't just advocates for members of the queer community, but also role models for all women. These are the kind of people that our country needs more of, now more than ever. A recent survey found that public support for LGBTQ people has dropped. This goes to show, I think, that bad attitudes start at the top. 
but generational change is coming. And I believe with all my heart that we're headed towards a brighter moment than the one we're living through right now. A future where everyone is accepted for exactly who they are. I see a new generation of empathetic young leaders every day. Young people like Emma, a formidable activist whose confidence and clarity of vision give us so much hope. All my talented colleague, Bill Picardi, who has committed his career to inspiring us to be the change we wish to see. So I am optimistic, and that op optimism comes directly from all of you. I look around this room and I feel overwhelming gratitude for the friendships that I have made and the lessons that I have been taught to open my heart, to challenge old thinking, to raise my voice. I've learned to envision the world as we want it to be, as we, know, we all know it can be. So let me say thank you once again to all of you. And I know that we'll get where we're headed and sooner than you think. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. It is wonderful to be here tonight to celebrate our community and the people who are leading the charge in the fight for LGBTQ equality. It has been a tumultuous year. But together, we've been moving forward as a community to protect each other, to protect our rights, and to protect the vision of a better future for everyone. People are finding new ways to change the world, and the connectedness of movements and collaboration between communities is becoming even stronger in the face of ever-present threats to our core values and our most fundamental liberties. There is no more stunning example of this than the work of the students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Our guest and honoree, Emma Gonzalez, who are deeply honored to have You know, in the aftermath of that tragedy, so many in our nation shifted from feeling profoundly powerless to being reinvigorated and rejoining the push for sensible gun regulations that will proactively save lives. the change in the air at the March for Our Lives rally, which, by the way, was the largest student protest in U.S. history. So whether it was from 11-year-old Naomi Waldler, who shared that she was there, yes, she was amazing, she was there to represent three African-American teenagers who died from gun violence, and so she decided she would lead a walkout protest at her elementary school, elementary school, in Alexandria, Virginia, to Emma, who at 18 years old is teaching us that bravery, honesty, and empathy can and will change the world. <laughs> Emma, you never got to meet Edie Windsor. She was a hero, and she was a friend. And she was perhaps just a little bit taller than you at 88 to your 18. Um, but your spirit reminds me so much of her. Um, she changed our country and caused so many hearts to turn towards love and away from hate. And I just know, and I'm positive, and I think Judith would back me up, 
she would have been so proud of you and so thrilled to see the way you're living your life. So thank you. I want to thank Naomi, Emmy, Emma, and Edie, and all of those young and old who are showing us the way through this new darkness, showing us that we can't be silent even when we think no one is listening. In fact, that's precisely the moment when we need to get louder. And I promise you, at the center, throughout New York State, across the country, the voices of the LGBTQ community are getting louder. Earlier this week, the center organized the state's first ever LGBTQ Executive Directors Congress in Albany, New York. We brought together more than 30 organizations of all sizes across New York State to build the core of a coalition that will advocate for a shared vision of progress for our great state. We've had a lot of past successes in New York that we should still celebrate. And we have allies in government, you know who you are, who are willing to fight. But the fact is that there has been no major legislation at the state level advancing LGBTQ equality in nearly seven years. This is New York State, remember. So for a state that wants to be among the most progressive, we still have some work to do. Just ask the trans woman of color in the Bronx whose livelihood, which just ended by some well-meaning legislation aimed at sex trafficking, or the young person in my hometown of Syracuse who thinks, with everything going on, maybe it's just better to not come out. Or ask any one of the LGBTQ immigrants who pour into our doors for safety and support and answers that no one has. And what pains me even more than that is to think about the people, especially youth, people of color, elders, transgender and gender expansive community members, and people living outside of New York City, or even in the outer boroughs of New York City, who I'm telling you are too scared to even speak up or show up at all. They are living in the shadows and they are just hoping to survive another day in this country. So with service organizations struggling to keep up with the overwhelming demand for help, which for us has been a 30% increase since the 2016 election, it would be too easy to leave for another day the work of creating a statewide movement to mobilize individuals as change agents. But the easy way is not an option. We know we must collaborate with colleague organizations. Many of you are in the room tonight, thank you my colleagues, um, to build and rebuild LGBTQ power in New York State, unifying our voices on legislation and practices that will change the lives of LGBTQ New Yorkers for the better. I am so proud and honored to say that the center, because of you, all of you, because of decades of service to our communities, because of decades of activism, we are in a position to step up and lead in an even bigger way. And being a leader for us means more than stepping up. It also means knowing when to step back and make space for allies and people on the front lines. We cannot ignore the massive structures working against us right now I think Anna put it best. We cannot ignore the massive federal government that is trying to obstruct our rights and our freedom. But let's imagine, if we can, for just a moment, a different world. Imagine, for example, if we were working with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that was focusing on, rather than forbidding medical providers to take steps to create more affirming, culturally competent environments for their LGBTQ patients. 
Imagine if instead of focusing on how religion can be a license to discriminate, they worked with us to offer our program that empowers families to accept their LGBTQ children for who they are, to keep their families unified, and to keep kids from ending up on the street. Now I know perhaps that's a little far-fetched and too much to imagine right now, but we can't imagine it in New York City. And we can't imagine it in New York State. And we can work with our partners in government to ensure that LGBT people are counted, regardless of what happens with the national census, that medical and social service providers are required to receive training so they know us and they know how to help us. New York has a history of being one of the most progressive states in the country. So let's really be progressive. Let's create a state with progressive laws that serves as a model for the rest of the country, and let's leverage one of the most able and ready communities to drive this change, the LGBTQ and allied community. We're talking about all of you. The young people at Parkland who banded together as activists to say, never again. Show us the potential their generation has to make the world a better place. I get to see that potential every single day when I talk with young people in our program at the center. And so tonight, it is my great honor to share the story of Arcadius Evergreen. There couldn't possibly be a better name. <laughs> A longtime center youth participant who has been coming to us since he was 16 years old. At 21, Arcadius' story is one of persistence and perseverance to be true to himself and to support those around him who need the same encouragement to live the lives they deserve. As our community, it is our job to step up and to provide young people with the support and resources they need to survive and shine. And then to step back and be there for them as they astonish us with what they can do. Here is Arcadius' story. Join me in giving a very warm welcome to Arcadius as he joins us on stage. <laughs> Because part of finding my own path 
after struggling with substance use involves gratitude and doing um, for others. The center is providing me a chance to do just that, and it feels wonderful. After my own experience with coming out to my family and substance use, I can't believe that today I'm able to share a stage with these amazing honorees. And it's my pleasure to recognize an outstanding person who is doing so much for the LGBT visibility by fighting to keep the country safe from gun violence. She is a student activist, co-founder of the hashtag Never Again Movement, and president of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Gay Straight Alliance. She is tonight's Community Impact Award honoree and my personal hero. Please welcome Emma Gonzalez.
to be able to continue my work of increasing trans inclusion and to be on the board of the center. I am very proud of that. It definitely feels like it's a full circle moment here for me. I'm standing here as a, as a very proud transgender woman of color, a proud immigrant. have found my trans mother named Tiger Lily. Yes. When I was 15 years old, she asked me to join a, my first trans pageant. And that night, I ended up winning second runner-up, best in swimsuit, and best in long gown. It changed my life. Being a trans beauty queen actually became my job. You know, that's not a bad first job, right? At 15 years old. It, I found my chosen family. I found my best sisters during those formative years. But you see, in the Philippines, trans people are culturally visible, but not politically recognized. It's a majority conservative Catholic country where you could attend a morning weekend church, then go home and watch a trans pageant on national television at lunchtime. That irony is not lost on me. So when I moved to California, it was almost the other way around. There was a degree of political recognition, but there was no trans pageant on national TV. I, mean, I remember one of the first questions I had, where is the trans pageant? I just want to join. As a young immigrant, I was helped by trans women like Cecilia Chung, Tita Aida, Tamika, and the many trans Filipina in San Francisco at the time at the community center that supported me and welcomed me in a country and a culture that was all new to me. As a model for many years and even before I came out, I remember going to castings thinking, are they gonna find out? Is this the day when they find out? I remember this one job that I did. I was doing a commercial for a lip gloss commercial and when I got home, I was so paranoid. This is it. They will find out. Looking back at that time, I was so afraid and full of shame. You see, I was working in an industry that is all about the power of imagery, but I was not being seen as my authentic self. There was no space at that time. So when I decided to come out and share my story to the world on a TED Talk, I wanted it to be big. I wanted it to mean something. I wanted to take that risk. I launched Gender Proud Productions with my friend and <coughs> co-founder, Ali Hoffman, to advocate for transgender rights and produce intersectional stories on what it means to be trans and gender non-conforming. One of our first projects was actually to spend time at the center, to spend time with trans youth at the trans youth program at the LGBT Center and simply ask them to define what is beautiful for them? That project became an inspiration to our first web, se web series and TV special with Logo TV. We need to continuously support and give space for trans youth, especially trans youth of color, to be who they are. As a producer, it is critical that I center the most marginalized when it comes to storytelling. A series that we produce with Fusion TV about the experiences of trans women of color when it comes to employment featured Alexis, an immigrant in New York, a college graduate from Argentina, newly transitioned. She shared her stories of rejection and job applications, but also her perseverance to be who she is. Trans people of color have four times the national unemployment rate. 47% of trans and gender non-conforming people in the U.S. were not hired or denied promotions because of our identity. When we center stories of the most marginalized, we begin to deconstruct the intersecting layer of institutional transphobia, racism, sexism, classism, ableism. Yes, we've made progress, but the last year, 27 trans people most are people of color, most are under the age of 35 were killed 
here in the United States. We can't continue this way. And as a storyteller, it is revolutionary to learn and show complicated lives of trans people beyond our transition stories. You know, I just want to be lost in stories of trans people falling in love. In sci-fi, utopian movies, where are my trans brothers and siblings? I think trans people are the real unicorns. Trans people's ability to survive, to thrive, to claim our space of worth is a lesson in enlightenment. In this current political drama, the constant attack on trans and LGBTQ lives, I'll tell you what. Oh, sorry, sir. I will make my voice the loudest that it could be, and I will never, ever apologize for being who I am. Thank you so much. Here's a message from actor and musician Darren Chris. Good evening, everybody. Hello from London. Uh, old friend Darren Chris here. Uh, while I'm very sorry I couldn't be there tonight, it is nonetheless my honor and privilege to present the LGBT Community Center's Trailblazer Award to my friend and my colleague, Ricky Martin, for his steadfast champion of the LGBT community, as well as work, as his work for children, and on behalf of the people of Puerto Rico. Um, Ricky, gosh, he's done a lot. He's made a significant impact uh, on promoting uh, equal rights for the LGBT community. Uh, his message is very simple, that the LGBTQ community deserves the same things that all people do, uh, which is an equal chance to raise their families and take care of loved ones and be able to live openly and honestly. He has built such a beautiful family with his husband, Juan, and his wonderful, beautiful, adorable children, Mateo and Valentino, and uh, are really an example for all of us LGBT or straight. Um, and that family is about love, equality, and respect. Um, Ricky is also a fierce advocate of children worldwide. He's the founder and president of the Ricky Martin Foundation, where he uses his platform to denounce human trafficking and educates about its existence through academic research and community uh, initiatives, um, all anchored in the defense of children and youth rights. Um, most recently, in the tragic aftermath of Hurricane Maria, Ricky and the Ricky Martin Foundation created a, dis a disaster relief. Uh, it was a disaster relief fund, um, which brought urgently needed help to Puerto Rico, raising over five million dollars. They've impacted more than 150,000 families with their community efforts across Puerto Rico, and have shipped more than 300,000 pounds of basic needs and medical supplies. I feel so very lucky to call Ricky my friend, and I'm humbled and grateful that he shares his immense talents and big heart with the world. So a big congratulations on this very well-deserved honor, Ricky. Much love to you. Please welcome to the stage the next Trailblazer Award honoree, Ricky Martin. Difficult for me to talk. He slapped me once, 
and not have to slap me twice to stop talking because that's just the way it's going to be. Thank you so much for this opportunity. God bless you all. Let's not, let's not stop. Let's keep fighting. Let's keep fighting for equality. Let's keep fighting for love. And uh, I feel like um, the most blessed man today because of my kids, but because my husband is here tonight. Thank you so much for being so amazing. God bless you. Thank you. On behalf of the staff, the board, and those that use and visit the center, congratulations to all of the evening's honorees. And thank you all for your support this evening. Thank you to our co-chairs and our host committee. And thank you, of course, to Randy Rafo. Our auction, remember that the auction runs through Monday, April 23rd, so keep bidding through the weekend. Because, oh, I don't know the answer to this. This is funny. Because of your incredible support tonight, we have raised over one point. Someone want to tell me? You have to say, six? Oh my God, 1.6 million. Oh! Thank you, and good night.